<laughs> Welcome to the show, Austine. Well, thank you, Marty. I'm happy to be here. I'm really glad you decided to come this evening because you have a very interesting project you're working on, and it's part of an NGO, a nonprofit that you started. So tell us about the nonprofit and some of the work you're doing as it relates to consumption literacy. Well, um, my nonprofit, or the nonprofit that I started, is uh, really looking at how we see natural resource use in everyday consumption. And so um, my work really revolves around looking at what's embedded in the things that we do and we buy and we um, partake in everyday lives. And just sort of the commodity chains, what's wrapped up into them. And um, so right now with the Consumption Literacy Project, we're in schools, working with high school and elementary, and um, you know, really focusing on that idea of understanding about what goes into producing things that we use and what goes into the waste after we're done with them. And so we're doing that just sort of age appropriate. It sounds like a great project, and um, we've worked together. You were a doctoral student in the University of Colorado, Denver. I was uh, fortunate enough to be on your mm. committee. So um, is the work you're doing now related to any of the academic training you've had? And if so, how is it related? So it's a direct line from it, and um, that was exactly what I did with my students. I taught an environmental science class, and what I noticed was that you know, talking about the bigger issues of climate change or air pollution and water pollution felt daunting. They felt like we didn't have the power to change that, that it was more like governmental or institutional level kind of change that needed to happen. And so what I did was boil it down into just what we do every day and talking about it that way where we are seeing the um, fossil fuels that are embedded in the production line of things that we use. Or My favorite was thinking about the water behind things and one pair of jeans took 1,800 gallons to produce just one pair. And so you think of the clothes that we just buy for, you know, on sale for 10.99 or 39.99 and the amount of stuff that's wrapped up into the production of the stuff that we pull into our lives, you know? What's great about the project is it intersects in many different ways with cannabis. I know the work with the Consumption Literacy Project is not directly related to cannabis, but the model you use is easily applicable. So maybe go a little bit deeper, like in terms of the current projects you're working on, give us a little more tangible details about what exactly you're doing and how do you know you're successful? Like what do you use to measure your success? Well, um, one project we're working on is using the curriculum that I built, looking at consumption in this way, um, with a high school. And they are going through the first, um, the first assignment is they come up with a product that they believe in, that they use, and they research it to find what it took to create that product, where that product came from, how far it traveled, the amount of fossil fuels that it took to come to us. Um, the people that were uh, employed and how they were employed or the labor that was involved and how the people were treated, how the communities were treated, and, um, and then what happens, like how long that they get to use it and then how do they end the product? Where does it go when they're done with it? And so that's just one of the assignments. And then as we go on throughout the semester, then we start talking about the bigger things like climate change and how this is all relevant to that, the bigger stuff that we see going on. Another one that well, I'm really excited about now is we're, lo we're working with an elementary school and these elementary students are going to um, do a student-led essay into looking at how much waste is in their school cafeteria and working with their own principals and um, the Denver um, City Waste Services to see if we can actually compost and redirect the food waste that's in there coming out of their cafeterias. It, it sounds cool. Are you finding at the different levels that you're dealing with, are they excited about it? And if so, what are the things that they get into and what are the things that maybe like you're working on to make it a little more you know, pleasant or joyful for them? Because I know these projects, they can be really fulfilling, especially when people look in like their own lives and, and apply it. And so I'm just curious what kinds of like responses have you had from uh, either elementary students and or at the high school level? Well, the high school um, is the one that's the really the so amazing to see because sometimes uh, you know at that age they're a little less engaged in you know a science class and um, 
And what I find is that students are empowered because it, they feel empowered because it's, it's little, they're seeing where they can make little tiny changes in their own lives that collectively, that those small changes collectively end up becoming a big change, you know? And so um, that feels really empowering. And it feels like you're not, you're not hoping that someone up higher up is gonna make the change or the decision to do better but we can do it and bond together with you know people that we know in community. Um, with the elementary students, we're just starting, and so it's a pilot right now, and um, we've just really started the conversation. And so the jury's still out. But I, you know, I think that it's, what I'm most excited about is to think of that same empowering idea, that mentality of thinking that you have the ability to make a change. You don't have to rely on large government or um, someone else to make it, that you can do that. And uh, every day these students will be able to go into the cafeteria and see the change that they started, which well, will it's, be it's, amazing. Yeah, it's cool because they get a little more sensitive to the things that they're consuming and what they're directly using in their life and then also to be critical and to, yeah. to think along those lines. So I know with a lot of the work that I do, you know, at the end of the day, five o'clock, you know, I put it aside and that's the end of it. Is this something that is a lifestyle for you or is this just something that's part of like your job? Well, you know me and so very much so. It is a part of my life. Yeah, and my, um, in my yard, we have created a cooperative where I work with my neighbors and um, through working and, and building growing food and now we have an apiary and uh, we have chickens. And so it's, we've been building relationships with people around us to try and raise food for our families. And um, the apiary has five neighbors involved with it. The chickens is myself and another. And um, neighbor, and you know, it's a, it's, it is a lifestyle. It's exactly every time I'm thinking about right now. I'm refurbishing my basement or refinishing my basement to try and uh, rent it out, and I have to get furniture in there. And you know, it's a, so we, I had a bed built with an old door, and you know, it's just trying to think of like simple ways that we cannot buy into the box industries. That's great. It's so needed today, too, because there's a lot of unnecessarily waste um, that people are generating. Um, let's go back to the Consumption Literacy Project. Um, how did you get involved with it? And then tell us about, um, you know, who's involved with it or what are the kinds of um, objectives that you have with the Consumption Literacy Project? So our mission is to really understand and become more aware of the stuff that we do every day and the natural resources that are used in the process of all of the things that we do. Um, I am so excited. We, uh, we've done a big shift in our organization, so we've now been incorporated for two years. And um, we have 16 board members of really committed, active board members that are helping to bring this about and um, creating all of these new places for us to bring the work. And so now we're in um, 10 schools, working with lots of elementary kids. We've piloted in one high school and have an opportunity to go into a second high school now um, and raise it as a concurrent enrollment course, this environmental science course. So we're sort of leveraging this idea of col college mentorship and critical thinking and creative thinking, which is really bound into this sort of unraveling of our lives and trying to understand because nothing is on a label. You have to infer and actually sometimes when you research a lot of it is invisible and so you have to be able to think outside the box to understand the impact. And I know with some of the work that you do and I don't know if it's directly related to the Consumption Literacy Project, um, it involves video. <coughs> so we worked on um, you know, the methodology and the process called digital storytelling, which is, as you know, you know these short videos, first person narratives with uh, photographs and music and uh, maybe sound effects. And so tell me a little bit about the role of video and imagery in some of the work that you do. So in the high school course is where, we, where we're using that. Um, that may come into play with the elementary. Uh, we're not, sh we haven't made a plan for it yet, but um, certainly would like to document the process of what these kids are going through. But in the high school, uh, that's sort of, instead of doing a final test or a final report, I, 
I stopped doing that because I felt like in, in the university setting, my students were not as engaged in doing something that's more regurgitation. And, um, and so what we did, and that wasn't the culture of the class either, because I really focused on thinking about this in a, um, in a very personal way. And for each of us, it's very different. Your life is very different from mine. And so essentially your life will have different impacts and there'll be different products or different things that you have in your life that make your lifestyle. And so it was really important to me to come up with a way of showcasing that for students of what they got out of my class. And I had um, the honor of being in one of your <laughs> classes and learned how to do a digital story and thought this would be great as a final project for this class. And so I tried it. And, um, and what I found was that students, the prompt was really for them to tell me what they learned. I didn't want to box it in too much because I really just wanted to know what they got out of the class. And it's amazing to see how at the end of the semester, we'll, when they're doing their assignments, they're collecting photos. So we always did a photographic essay. So one reflection image to really capture what they thought for the assignment that week. And then they kind of compile those, and by the end of the semester, they have a reservoir to use. Maybe they use other, video, other photos instead. And they build a story around the aha moment that they had or something that really resonated with them of all the things that we talked about. And, and they'll really capture that story and then um, create a two-minute digital story with a, sh with a narrative. And, um, and the music and pr the title and the credits and it's a, just a short production and so it's fun for them. And then at the end we have a celebration. So it's not a, that they're being tested on the information, it's more that we're having a celebration of what we've learned over the semester. Oh, that's great. It's so refreshing because it's a different kind of um, process than just writing the paper and um, I'm glad you brought up the course that you took because I think that was around the time we first met which was like a l several years ago mm -hmm. and then since then you've done a couple of um, multimedia projects digital storytelling and and other things what mm. what advice would you give to people if they want to start their own nonprofit and then what makes your nonprofit sort of unique Wow um, well I you know I kind of jumped in knowing that I had a heart mission that I felt I really wanted to do which is start raising educational awareness, educational programming, and a different kind of way of approaching environmental science in the schools. Um, I had no idea that starting this nonprofit would also mean um, a fair amount of business understanding, which has probably not always been my strength. And um, so that, and there's also a fair amount of, you know, networking with people and, uh, and really the, um, I'm a very social person, but this is in a more professional way of really building um, professional relationships of um, 16 board members and staying uh, in in a relationship with them, where you with communication that you're knowing who they are and keeping them sort of inspired, not feeling overwhelmed because they're volunteer and and then there's the whole piece of the incorporation process and all of that stuff. So it's been quite the huge undertaking that I had no idea. I just jumped into it. And it's been a learning, fun, awesome journey, but it's certainly been quite a bit of learning. And I'm part of a couple nonprofits, so I understand uh, the time that it takes, um, how communication could make or break a nonprofit with the board members and, mm -hmm. of course, community members. And then also just the administrative uh, time it takes. Right. I'm a treasurer for one uh, nonprofit. And it's uh, not a lot of work, but it's just a matter of being organized and then doing things well so that you don't have to put out fires from the mistakes that you make. Right. So I appreciate the work you're doing. And um, you mentioned the Consumption Literacy Project has a website. Mm -hmm. So if people visited the website, what would they see? Well, uh, we're in our sort of second phase of evolution with our website. And um, what you'll see on the website is largely about our mission and the, the values that we hold and the vision that we have. Um, for creating informed citizens that are able to think critically and creatively and personally about, you know, our, um, the consumption that we do every day. And, and it's sort of, you know, the mundane. It's just the things that happen every day that we, that we need to brush our teeth and buy our food and that, that kind of stuff. So um, really on the website you'll see the mission vision um, and what we want to see in the world, and um, w the next phase will be 
putting our programming up there, but we've been really focusing on getting the programming going and not really uploading it onto the website. So you um, maybe in the next month you'll see that. Well, I know I look forward to seeing the new stuff that you put onto it. I've seen earlier versions of the website, and I, I think it's great. And it's a, a nice resource for people to check out. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is your project, the Consumption Literacy Project, doesn't necessarily focus on cannabis, but the framework, the infrastructure that you developed can easily be grafted onto cannabis. So we um, are in Denver, Colorado. The nonprofit that you work with is in Denver. Mm -hmm. So we're in like the, the epicenter of cannabis culture, cannabis um, capitalism. So what advice would you have for someone who really wants to look at cannabis from the perspective that you bring, and then how could they sort of run with an idea s uh, about consumption or a critical approach to cannabis that could be uh, helpful and maybe address some of the environmental problems associated with cannabis production? Well, that's, you know, I, when I think about cannabis, the cannabis being legalized in uh, Colorado, it's, it's, it's all around the fun of it and everybody enjoying that it's legal. And, um, I, and it occurred to me when I saw an a, a interview that you did that we aren't really talking about so much about the environmental cost to the industry or that the industry is having here. And I, I just, um, in my own little world, I see that it feels like there's been a big shift, you know, where we had in the beginning, there may have been some small operations and now they've become really large and sort of that box model. And sometimes I, I wonder if, if those larger box model, um, cor I don't know, would they be called corporations? Or yeah, they're corporations and they're really big. Yeah, and so, you know, what drives them is the, uh, the money at the end of the day. and. And I wonder about, um, you know, if some of them, for me specifically, I'm thinking, gosh, if we're, if we're growing something that's medicinal, if we, if we set aside the recreational part and think about the medicinal part, but what is going into creating these, this medicine that's supposed to heal us? And I'm thinking about the amount of chemicals that are applied to those plants and um, the cleaning solvents that go through the, the grow houses. And so you wonder about the stuff there that's going in. The other thing that I, that I just thought was talking with a friend of mine about is just the sheer amount of energy costs. Mm -hmm. The energy costs have risen way up, so we're using more fossil fuels. But aside from that, I, I wonder about the, if you think about the petroleum-based products that are being brought in to, to house these, you know, grow operations. And so you got the plumbing and the piping and the containers, and it's all petroleum-based, you know? And so in addition to the chemicals, they're also probably petroleum-based. And so, it, you know, I just, I, I think it, it, yeah, it takes a, we have to take a pause and wonder what kind of ways are they growing this medicine or, or the recreational, you know, people who are using it recreationally too, because certainly it's affecting plants uptake some of that. And so uh, there's health concerns too, I wonder, you know? Yeah, so there's many things that you touched on, which I really appreciate. So what would you say would be, you know, just a brainstorm um, for a consumer to think through the products that they consume that are cannabis infused or, or you know, um, dabs or flour or all the other kinds of products. What could mm -hmm. a consumer do to educate themselves about the environmental cost or what went into the production of that? Like what would be a couple first steps for people to think of just to be a conscious consumer and to be part of a movement that is recognizing that cannabis, it's, it's I'm 100% behind legalization and normalization, but there's some costs there that right. we aren't sufficiently addressing because I think many of us in the industry, whether educational or out to make money, have to deal with all of the the pressure and the stigma and just trying to make it normal. And so anything that highlights critique sometimes is maybe sort of pushed on the carpet because there's so many other battles to fight. So again, I'm just curious, what would you say to someone who wants to make that first step to be conscious and where could, what could they do or what kind of approach would you recommend they take? Well, what I teach about is really just sending your feelers out into every piece of the of the um, production that you can one one easy one is you know googling trying to understand what kinds of chemicals are used and things like that i 
I think the other place that might just be interesting to talk to is the people at the store that you choose to buy at. You know, just asking them, do you guys use chemicals on these? Do you have organic, you know, products? Um, what are, you know, how is that monitored? Maybe having a better understanding of are we monitoring the, the pesticides? And maybe that's a good question for you because I'm just starting to understand it. Yeah, there's different um, entities that are doing testing and um, if you as a business fall below a certain threshold in terms of what's in the product, then you're, you've met, you know, the requirements. So there's been a number in the last two years of companies that have had their weed confiscated and they have had penalties because of too much uh, chemical residue and so but i think yeah asking the bud tenders questions is really important yeah um, i find with the research i've done many of the um, workers that i've had some conversations with complain about the powdery mildew and the mold that gets moved from the flower gets moved from the, the cultivation facilities to the shelves. And so even asking a bud tender, you know, can you confirm with me that this marijuana, this cannabis, uh, is free from mold and powdery mildew? Like that question alone, um, you know, whether or not they tell you the truth or whether or not there's any um, evidence, um, you know, consumers have to start demanding that because that seems to me one of the, the largest questions that people have about um, the products that they're consuming. Right. And I don't, you know, I, I wonder, you hit on it, what I was thinking in my head is if you go up and you ask them, how truthful are they going to be about what happens in the back, you know, where there's closed doors and the customers aren't allowed to see. Um, and so, you know, maybe even just reputation, asking around with reputations of different, um, of different companies that have their their storefronts in different places and where, they're, where they get their weed from, where it's sourced, and, um, and asking those stores maybe what kinds of chemicals are being put on these things. I think that's just, it's just kind of digging. We have to, s to start digging for the information. And right, and we're at a great time because since there's not a lot of research that's been done on this kind of stuff, there could be um, you know, community projects or you know, uh, research projects in, in a university. Um, what's your knowledge or view about when you look at consumerism and you look at products, these labels that say they're ethical or produced in um, you know a way that was um, involving fair labor or good practices, like like what have you heard about these labels in your research or in your work with the Consumption Literacy Project, um, and and how you think they might fit into the cannabis sector? Well, um, if I understand the question right, I I feel like um, labels sometimes can be misleading. You know, it depends on. Um, what it is. The other day I walked into Sunflower, or Sprouts now, and they had a package of gummy bears and they were on, they were saying that it was gluten free and you know, and they made it look healthy. But when you flip it over, the number one ingredient was high fructose corn syrup. And so, you know, I, I think we, that where, that's where it really comes into this idea of being able to think critically about what we're being fed and the information that we're being given. and being able to either validate or reject what you know we're given and just being that knowledgeable, empowered consumer, which is, it's difficult and frankly, it's frustrating. Yeah, and I, I like you, know, I have mixed feelings about um, labels and certification because on one level, um, it's a tool to educate consumers about you know what's in the product and you know there's some kind of reassurance because there's an official stamp that oh maybe this is like better than the other product that might be uh, you know worse in some way. At the same time, if a label or some kind of certification scheme is not produced by a third party and it's actually the cannabis companies themselves giving themselves a pat on the back for you know some kind of uh, uh, best practices, then you have to wonder, is it more just a marketing tool or is it something that's legitimate to educate consumers? Um, but the key thing is more research needs to be done and there is an environmental cost associated with um, cannabis. Um, uh, one other kind of question for you, since you are engaged in this on many different levels, if I was to work with you with sort of university students and develop a project for us to kind of pull together a cannabis, uh, you know, literacy project or that dealt with uh, the value chain, understanding all the different segments, how would we do that? And what would you say would be um, a good direction to go with a project like that? Um. Well, I would probably showcase, uh, maybe you start with different places. You know, I, one thing I, w I was thinking is if you, if you find a place that is ethical, 
that is doing things that are um, that are doing things where they care about the product that they're offering to their customers and that they don't want their product having saturated with mold or chemicals on it that um, I think the supporting that piece of the industry maybe could could also you know move away from these big the power of these big boxes that mm -hmm. we we as consumers have the power to shift that and so I I I feel like for one would start looking at the the different companies like the different growers where they grow how they grow it would be a research kind of from right. what I see you know well, I hope um, we can keep in touch because in May of 2018, I'll teach another course, Cannabis Cultures at UC Denver. And then to have you guide us, me and the students, about how to do it well, meaning design a project, uh, think through the different steps to you know, collect information, uh, maybe do interviews, do the research on Google and find published research, and then create some kind of handy tool that could be used uh, for other instructors or just to educate the general public. Yeah. Um, so going back to the Consumption Literacy Project, again, it, you don't necessarily focus on cannabis, but what are the different tools that you have that are for the general public or that are resources that people can um, uh, obtain for themselves to understand what you're doing? Well, um, I don't know if we've created a tool for the general public w other than I've created, a, I wrote a life, it's called the Life Book. And that's uh, my way of helping to guide students through this process of really starting to understand the different, it's kind of like if you look at a crystal, there's all d these different angles to it, and that's kind of how I see consumption, that you know, it's, it's the amount of fossil fuels that are embedded in things, and then we have to think about the water that's embedded in things. Uh, you know, we live in a, in a really dry region here, and I wonder how much water is being used for these grow operations that it gets cycled through and then it, wa it leaves with all those chemicals in it, you know, and that just gets put into our water system and down onto the next user. And so um, if I were to do it, I, I think we would be, and I think that sounds like a wonderful <laughs> project, but the, and the thing that I, I think would be really important would be to start looking at the, those different angles separately. It takes time to sort of look at one, okay, so let's look at the fossil fuels. Where are they? How are they used? And you, it's really a, a brainstorming, you know? Really trying to critically think about all of the different places that fossil fuels are embedded in this industry. It's not just the energy cost. There's so much more. I mean, the transportation and moving things around. The other thing is what happens to all the waste? Mm -hmm. You know? So I, I, I feel like there's a, there's, it's, it would be a process of looking at all these different angles. And then at the end of it, we can kind of come up with what we, you know, our conclusions about what we find would yeah. be really interesting. Yeah, you, you covered a lot of areas in what you just said. And there is, um, a set of practices that have been uh, conducted to address some of the waste issues. So in Denver and Colorado, there's been some effort to, uh, in a robust way, try to ensure that the waste is um, dealt with properly and to minimize waste, and of course to cut energy costs, cut energy consumption. <coughs> but I think more research needs to be done to see how effective they are, and then to see how um, the practices that are working well, how they can be scaled up, and not only outside of Colorado, but in all the other countries that are also doing um, cannabis production and learning from other countries that are doing it well. Um, we're, we're out of time now, but just one more time, if you can, give people the website, mm -hmm. and how can they get a hold of you if they want to learn more about the uh, the Consumption Literacy Project? Well, the website is www.consumptionliteracy.org. It's at the bottom right there. And uh, you can email me, austin at consumptionliteracy.org. And there is also a, f our phone number is on the website too. Yeah.